go ahead and maybe share uh, on your Facebook page and your feed um, as this information that we will be sharing this evening um, is not only to bless you, but also those that are uh, tuning in on your network as well. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone uh, is able to get this information and be blessed today. Um, as we know that uh, this is definitely going to uh, bless you as you hear it today. Uh, today's presentation, uh, as we look at Smart Saver Series, and this is something that we are going to be doing in the next uh, three weeks, not consecutively. We will be doing it today, which is the seventh. Uh, we will go again um, on the uh, 14th. We will miss a week and then we will come back again on the 28th at the end. So those three sessions together. Uh, and I know that you're going to be uh, blessed and that you definitely will learn something. Um, so whether you're tuning in from uh, Facebook, uh, whether you're tuning in from our Zoom uh, attendees, we just want to let you know that you are able uh, to ask some questions as we go along as well. It's probably easier on the Zoom, but I do have my Facebook page up as well. Um, and that is to facilitate any questions that you may have as we continue on with today's presentation. Um, so I know, I think there's an echo and it may be coming from yours, right, Lovardo? Not a bit, and I'm not sure. Should be okay. Yeah. Sounds pretty clear. Okay, sounds good. So we're gonna go ahead and start. My name is Orlando Pule, and uh, I am the uh, co-director for Family Ministries, which encompasses family life, men's, women's, and uh, singles. And I lead this with my wife, uh, Pastor Elizabeth, and uh, we both oversee this ministry. Uh, we felt it necessary to um, see what we can do in the area of finances and helping uh, our finances. It is said that this is one of the most wealthiest generations uh, in terms of education, in terms of work, uh, in terms of the income that they are receiving. But this is also one of the most, um, how would you call it, uh, the most in debt generation as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just being able to manage these finances uh, and the understanding of it, hopefully it will help you and your family uh, and the trajectory that you may have. Um, before we start, I just want to share with you, um, as, as this is a, uh, from a stewardship perspective, yes. um, and uh, just wanted to start off with uh, two verses that I want to share with you today. The first one is is one of the most recognizable verses that uh, we uh, hear very often, and that is Genesis 1-1, uh, where it says, in the beginning, yeah. God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah. And so in this understanding that uh, God owns everything, he created everything. Um, and so part of this understanding of finances is that God has blessed us also with finances. Yes. Um, the Bible tells us that uh, he owns cattle on a thousand hills and all the silver and gold belongs mm -hmm. to him. And so part of this uh, understanding of stewardship is that understanding that God is not only creator, but Lord of all. And if yes. he is, then he has to be God and creator of our finances too. Mm -hmm. So we so manage it within this framework that God owns everything and that we are here as good stewards to be able to manage what God has given to us. Uh, the second verse that I just want to mention very briefly is one that we know, Matthew uh, 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Uh, when we put these two things together, God is creator and Lord of all. Um, and for us to be able to seek that, seek that God is uh, above everything else, then God will give us the wisdom that we need in order to manage not only our families, our finances, our work, our schedules. If we truly believe that he is Lord and that he is God, yes. then everything will be subservient 
to him. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we felt that this was very important, not only the debt that we had mentioned, um, but you know, for one, one of the statistics that is out there is that for every dollar that each um, earns, um, we have a debt uh, of a dollar seventy-two. So we're paying a dollar seventy-two to the debt that we have, uh, which is why we are, you know, uh, yeah. in debt and uh, we having trouble, you know, with our finances. And so hopefully we can kind of get around that, having God as Lord, um, but also just understanding that we can make a difference with yes. the money that we have, um, not only for our present generation, but also for generations that are to come. So just bow your heads with me very quickly. God, we just wanted to thank you for this time that we have together. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that uh, we may learn more about you and learn more about finances. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the presentation that is going to be shared today. Uh, and when all is said and done, may we just be better stewards, understand more, uh, and uh, manage the finances that you have given to us, not only as individuals, but also um, as family. So bless us now. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we ask uh, Lavardo, just very quickly, I just want to share with you some of the things that are up and coming. Um, and that is coming up in the month of uh, August. Okay. Uh, and the first one is our Elevate Men's Conference. Uh, we want to invite you to come out and join us. For those of you who are men, those of you may be uh, wives who um, can encourage your husbands as well to join us. Um, but it will be a men's conference. It's called Elevate uh, at the Toronto Market Marriott. Uh, and if you want to register, the address uh, to register at is AdventistOntario.org, AdventistOntario.org. Uh, um, the other one is a Young Women's and Women's Weekend, which is happening uh, in the month of October 12 and 14. Sorry, I didn't mention the uh, Elevate Conference, which is August 24-25. Okay. And uh, for the women's and young women's is October 12 and 14. So um, same place to register as well, adventistontario.org. Uh, if you have any questions, just uh, shoot us a link uh, or an email as well. Uh, so we're going to uh, introduce our speaker for today. Um, his name is Lavardo Thompson. And uh, just want to go ahead and just uh, say a few words, Lavardo. Uh, to our viewers today. First of all, thank you, Orlando, as well as your wife, Elizabeth, for allowing me the opportunity to partner with you in ministry, to share this information to individuals, not only in Canada, but possibly around the world. Mm. And so it's a privilege of mine. Thank you. Um, uh, so just, just give us a little bit about your background. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm from the sunny island of the Bahamas, Nassau to be specific. Um, went to Oakwood, late 1990s met my wife there um, in the program and she's canadian and we came to canada thereafter start having children we have three beautiful children nicholas keaton and tyler 14 12 and 2 respectively and my wife is nicole and i've been in the financial service industry as a broker for now approximately 15 years hmm. so what is knowing your background um, yes being in it for 15 years, what is it uh, about finances that drives you to want to help people in their finances? What is it that you see? My motivation came from my grandmother, believe it or not. I had the opportunity to live with her um, from 12 to 19. She was a domestic worker, but she believed in saving, paying tithe and returning offering. And even though she made, I think, was equivalent of $50 a day, she was able to pay off her mortgage in 15 years. Wow. Um, by setting aside, having priorities, knowing needs and wants. And so from that, I was able to transition into financial services indirectly because my undergraduate degree is in medical services, a pre-med in biology. But I always had a love for finances based on what I saw in the home. And so as part of your own, uh, what you saw growing up, what do you see today? What I see today is individuals that are much more educated, 
earn more money than their parents, but they don't have the discipline and the mindset to realize that I have to live not only for today, but tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So we are actually leveraging our, our future based on the lifestyle we want to live today. As you mentioned earlier, for every dollar that a Canadian earns, they're spending $1 and 72 cents. Mm -hmm. That means that 72 cents is above and beyond the money that they're earning. That 72, mm -hmm. that 72 cents is on a credit card. Mm -hmm. Which is why most people are, are in debt. So basically yes. people are living outside of their means. Yes. So the, the income and the expenditure is not, not balancing up. So, uh, and, and I think that that speaks to all of us. I think there are needs and wants that we have um, and just recognizing, I think the difference between those two things, needs and wants. Um, and, you know, the generation of consumerism where you just want it now and uh, you know that 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 seems to be something that we're facing um, as a society as well. Um, what I wanted to on to point out on that same point as well it's not only individuals but as a country, sixty percent of our gross domestic product comes from consumer spending. Hmm. That means the government and companies want us to spend in order for the economy to do well. Yes. Even yes. though we suffer on an individual basis, so commercials marketing. Everything is geared towards, you deserve it, spend, it doesn't matter, worry about tomorrow when it comes. So mm -hmm. there's an intentional plan, even from the system itself, to get us to spend above and beyond what we earn, and that's how they came up with credit cards. Okay, you're not earning the money? Let me come up with a system. I can get you the money, even though it's at 19.9%, because I still want you to spend. Mm -hmm. So remember, not the country might be doing well, but you and your family might be suffering. That's right. That's right. Uh, I, think it, I, I think they had said that uh, consumerism debt, um, I think we're either the fourth or the fifth in the world. Yes. Yes. North, so, in North America being Canada, yes. I think we're about four. It's a moving target. That's right. But it's extremely high and the trend is moving upwards. Yes. Uh, and and if, if my memory serves me correctly, I think it's in the trillions. <laughs> is what, uh, yeah. So, yes. so definitely that's, that's something that, uh, that we would have to look into. So um, lead us tonight in the discussion, in the topic that you want us to, uh, to, to move with. Um, leave, the time is up to you. And I will ask for those of you who may have questions, uh, okay. please, uh, if you're on Zoom, there's a chat um, uh, segment on the bottom of your screen. You can actually... Um, chat and just uh, message me if there are certain questions that you may have during this presentation. For those of you who are on Facebook, um, I will check periodically as well for you just to make sure that you may have some questions as well. Okay. Once again, welcome to our financial webinar series. I would like to turn to the Word of God as a point of reference um, as we talk about how to be a smart saver and the dollars and cents of it. Orlando mentioned Genesis 1 verse 1, but in the same chapter, I will reference Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 to 28. Um, verse 27 mentioned God made man in his image. And the very next thing that he mentioned, he mentioned three things. Be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. Most of us, when we think of being fruitful, we think of having children and procreating. But in the principle of that word, to me, God is actually saying, we have something that we can actually magnify and do well with. So if God is going to tell me to be fruitful, there are two things I'm assuming. One, I must have a seed in order to be fruitful, meaning there's something in my hands that I can use hmm. in multiplying. So whether I'm earning 10000 or 100000 there's something I can work with. Secondly, if God is telling me to be fruitful, that, that means I have the capacity to be fruitful. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. cannot have an excuse that, oh, I can't save. My bills are too high. If God says it, I believe it. Hmm. The second point is to multiply. Meaning, in order not to be a hypocrite, we have to apply these principles to our lives. So when we talk to others, they can see what we're doing, not just what we're talking about. 
So he wants us to lead by example. And once we begin to be fruitful as individuals, we attract others. Think of a mango tree. When a mango tree that is fruitful and it has a mango, the mango tree doesn't stand up and give out mangoes. Once we see the mango on the tree, we're attracted to that mango and we go and we pick it. Once we start to align our lives to the word of God, individuals can see it and they're attracted to it because individuals are looking for something to hold on to, even in the area of stewardship. And the third point is, is to have dominion. Once we apply these principles ourselves, we multiply, meaning we impact others around us. And once we begin to continue to do that, we're going to change our environment. And once you change your environment and the numbers are on your side, you begin to dominate. So in the principle of Genesis 1, 27 and 28, that's what I believe as a Christian, that regardless of what I have from a financial standpoint, it's not about being rich. But if I manage it to the best of my ability and with a stewardship mindset, I can praise God and I can change my world immediately, those that are around me, as well as anywhere. So that's what God is telling us this afternoon, that we can be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion regardless of the number, regardless of our income. So the points we're going to discuss this afternoon are five points. The first one, the tools you need to build a solid plan. Secondly, how to save, how to invest, how to manage risk, and how to build an estate plan. I'm quite aware that individuals that are watching here this afternoon are in different age groups. Some of you are early in your career where you're paying off debts, be it student loans, credit cards, trying to buy your first home, having your first child. Some of you might be in your mid-career where you're trying to upgrade your education, traveling, vacations, saving for your child's post-secondary education. Some individuals might be in their peak career, putting their kids through university, paying off mortgage, pre-retirement, five to 10 years, normally 55 to 60, where you're now zoning and focus on retirement. You're taking care of elderly parents because if you're in your 50s, more than likely your parents will be in the 70s or 80s. And also planning a will because once we now see those around us getting to that ripe old age, we tend to think of our mortality as well. And then the last phase, there might be those online right now that are in retirement, enjoying their leisure time, also might be dealing with health issues, or sometimes even transitioning to a second career, okay? So how do you build a financial plan? There are three key areas, and I wanna be very practical and very simple this afternoon in terms of some of the points you need to consider in building a financial plan. The first area you, wanna, you want to consider is non-controllable events. How do I plan for things I have no control over? such as premature death. There's no such thing as premature death because when is our time to go, we have to go. But however, if you never plan for it, it's unexpected. Being diagnosed with a critical illness like heart attack, stroke, cancer, suffering a disability, being involved in a major accident. How do we deal with medical history from your family? You can't choose your family. If there's a family history of something, how do you deal with that? Also longevity. If you don't have a plan for these events, when these events occur, it can devastate you. According to statistics, the number one reason for bankruptcy is medical conditions. Whether to you, your significant other, your children, or even your parents. Point, um, let's take a point. For example, I'm working right now, my wife and I, and I die. I'm in my early 40s. Even if I'm earning $50,000 a year, that's over a million dollars that will be lost from my household if I was to die today. If my wife and I doesn't have a plan financially, it will be a very difficult struggle for her to pay the same existing bills that we both did when I was alive. Let's choose a scenario if I am alive and I'm diagnosed with a major heart attack or stroke. I might survive due to medical advancement, but I might be on disability if you have benefits to work, 
because about 50% of Canadians don't have any benefits, meaning any income replacement if something wants to happen to them. So you can go from earning a full income to partial being 60% or down to zero. Once again, you're alive, not dead, but if you don't have an emergency fund, if you don't have any savings, everything that you accumulated thus far will actually be lost. It will go in arrears, you probably have to file bankruptcy, and you don't even know due to your disability if you'll ever be able to work again. So medical situations, we tend to underestimate, but we all know we are born with two, what I call risk factors we cannot control. Mortality, Orlando, mm -hmm. and morbidity. Morbidity is the risk to get yeah. sick. You can't mm -hmm. control that. If you live long enough due to your diet, exercise, sleep, family history, and living to a ripe old age, something will go wrong with your body because we were born in sin and this body will break down over time. Also mortality. The Bible tells us no one will live forever. We will die. It's just when. And when that happens, if we don't have a plan, there are financial consequences. Once you go over the non-controllable events, this is how you actually put a plan in place. First of all, you identify what are the risks. I mentioned them earlier. Premature death, disability, critical illness. Once you identify them, you look at what I call the, you assess them. What's the probability that I'll be diagnosed with cancer, for example? I look at my mom, my dad, my grandparents, as well as the statistics that are out there. And the statistics are one in three Canadian will be diagnosed with cancer in a lifetime. So Orlando, I'll ask you the question. If I know there's a probability of one in three that I'll be diagnosed with cancer in my lifetime, would I just leave it up to chance hmm. or do something about it? That's a, high, that's a high probability. I mean, you'll have to do something about it. And uh, I, th I think for a lot of folks, um, sometimes we don't want to face those things. We don't want to face that death is imminent. Uh, we don't want to face that, you know, even in our generational history, there is illnesses that have been passed on from generation to generation. Though, the, those are some things we don't want to face. Yes. Um, but if we don't face them, um, you know, there's a larger consequence um, that we, we, we collide with uh, if we don't, you know, prepare for it. Um, I know that there's a lot of families that don't just don't have the funds as well. So it's not only we don't want to face it, but you know, how, how, how do we, how do we save in a way um, that we're still, you know, we're, we're, we're not living on, uh, you know, in school, we used to live on noodles, right. You know, uh, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, how, do, how, do, you know, and, and there's a lot of different things that, are, you know, our finances are being pulled to, I mean, you're, you're asking us to, to, to build a, 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 a savings account that is going to be, that will, will help you for at least nine months. <laughs> yeah. Saving is actually one way. So yeah. I will answer your question in two parts. First of all, I find it very funny that as Christians, we don't want to address the, the chances of dying or getting sick. Because mm -hmm. if we know this is not our home and we are passing through, and God is God of everything, why are we afraid to address difficult questions? I find it very ironic. I think we should embrace those type of questions because we know this is not our home. We're passing through and we have mm -hmm. to die and we have to get sick. And mm -hmm. the last time I checked, you cannot go to heaven unless you die. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. why be afraid of talking about death? I find it very ironic mm -hmm. that individuals are afraid to talk about these difficult yeah. topics. All right, but in order to um, actually to answer your second question is, how do we actually come up with the right solution and ensure that we're not living on ramen noodles or eating bread and butter while mm -hmm. we're addressing these issues? So mm -hmm. once we identify it, we assess it, because you cannot address everything. Resources are limited, right? You have a limited amount of income. So mm -hmm. from a risk perspective, we look at the probability of something happening and the impact. So certain things, for example, the chance of me getting old is high, but the chances of me being diagnosed with a critical illness might, is also high. 
So I have to weigh both of them. So if the impact is high, it's not even the probability. If the impact of something is high and it can prevent you from earning an income or devastate your savings, it's better now to look at an insurance plan where you're actually paying pennies on the dollar on a premium now that you're healthy. So in the event that something was to happen, you don't have to come out of pocket to pay for those things. So okay. that's a part of what I call the management process. So once mm -hmm. you have a problem, you can either avoid it, which a lot of people do. They put their heads in the sand, their head in the sand and say, you know what? I don't want to deal with it. But guess what? You can never avoid a problem because when you quote unquote avoid a problem, someone else have to deal with it. Sure. Your significant sure. other, your children, family, friends, the church. So you either avoid it, you either address it, meaning you save the money in the bank account, or if you're healthy enough, you can transfer the risk to an insurance company that you, while you're young and they can deal with it for you. And then the mm -hmm. last point is when, in dealing with risk, you monitor it. Every year, you look at your situation, you review it, and you make changes to it because things change, okay? So yes. today I might be healthy, next year I might not be. So you always wanna modify it, but you cannot, we cannot put our heads in the sand. Hmm. We have to answer the difficult questions. And as a steward, because we are managing God's, God's money, sorry, we should always be seeking out the best legal solutions that are available. Mm -hmm. Isn't that so? Because if you're, going to, if you're going to manage my money and I'm mm -hmm. expecting a return or for you to use that money as efficiently as possible, don't we have to actively continue to be reading and exposing ourselves to the information that's out there? So mm -hmm. once we find something better, we change. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I think when we look at this whole thing, like you said, it's, 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 it's income right? Yes. It's living within your means, knowing yes. what your, your needs and your wants are. Uh, and one of the things you talked about was balancing that budget. Yes. Uh, and one of the questions that has come in from one of the attendees is uh, that they're married with four children, various age groups. Yes. Uh, one is working full time and the other spouse is working part time. Yes. Um, how do they balance a budget? Uh, okay. Good point. Yeah. So the first thing you want to do is start off with a budget, meaning actually put pen to paper, write down what money is coming in, your mm -hmm. income, take a note of your expenses. The first thing you want to address is what I call priorities, food, clothes, and shelter within reason, because sometimes we can spend a lot of money on clothes. We can spend a lot of money on shelter and everything, but within reason, you address your basic needs, food, clothes, and shelter. After that, actually before that, let's, let's, let's go back again. First of all, if you're a Christian, you should pay your tithe or return your tithe, mm -hmm. set aside 10 to 20% in your savings, take care of your basic needs, food, clothes, and shelter, and any debt or expense, you make it work. So, so, so um, let's just say we have a hundred dollars. Let's just, let's just be practical with the number. Let's say we have a hundred dollars. Yes. 10 of that, for those of you who are Bible believing yes. um, and know that 10% goes back to God yes. through a tithe. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're saying is that another 10% needs to be saved. So 10, yes. uh, $10 out of that is saved. So now you have $80 yes. uh, for your food, clothing, just the basics yes. plus expenses. Expenses, other transportation, mm -hmm. whatever the other expenses may be. The reason mm -hmm. being is, we have to assume that we might not be employed tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if we don't set aside that 10%, how are we going to pay our future bills? Mm -hmm. The 10% the that you set aside will replace your employment income in the future. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is the more we make during our um, working years, the more we have to replace for our retirement in order to sustain the same lifestyle. Yes. That's why our working years is typically between 16 and 65. We have all these years because it's a great task to replace our employment income. So if you're earning $50,000 a year, you actually need from a gross perspective to save $1 million earning 5% to continually pay you $50,000 a year to continue the same lifestyle, to pay your bills and whatever you did before. That's why people gravitate towards employee benefits. 
such mm -hmm. as a pension plan, such as a group RSP plan, um, such as contributing to CPP. Because if you have money going towards those funds in the future, that will supplement your retirement income. So it's important mm -hmm. that we save today because a rainy day will come. Will come. That's right. It will come. Mm -hmm. And so that's how, what I would say. Even if you're a single mom or you're two individuals with four children, sometimes rather than renting an apartment, you maybe have to live in with someone or live in a basement. Or sometimes you, you can't afford to drive a car. You might take TTC or some form of ride share or carpool. There are ways that we can make it, Orlando. Hmm. But are we willing to make the sacrifices in order to survive? I, 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 think, I think that's probably where um, a lot of our wants comes into yes. it. Um, yeah. Because we're, you know, a consumer-driven uh, society. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, there are things where you will have to pull back from yeah. uh, in order to get ahead. Right? And I think it's making those, those choices um, as to how to get ahead. And it, it, like, like you said, it, it could mean moving in, you know, with your parents in the basement yeah. for a yeah. while in order to get mm -hmm. ahead. But, but the whole idea is to make sure that all the debt is, is paid. Make sure that there is no debt um, or consumer debt, so to speak. Um, in order for you to get ahead, that will have to be dealt with first. Yes, and I will get into that in greater detail okay. later on in the presentation, but yes. definitely you want to keep any consumer type debt, credit cards, lines of credit, loans and stuff at a minimum. First of all, if you're buying a house, you have to take on a loan. Most people don't have the funds to buy a house cash, mm -hmm. but outside of that, we want to keep any other type of consumer debt extremely low or pay it off. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once again, we have the opportunity because if you're born in North America, even if you're making minimum wage, you're earning more income than 80% of the world's population. Mm -hmm. So we have the resources, but how do we do it? And the best way I would say, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Look to the word of God, because if you follow others or the Joneses, we will put ourselves in situations that we are not supposed to be in simply because we want to be like someone else or because they have it, or we feel like we should have it, we get ourselves into emotional type spending. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we end up suffering. So yeah. if we go more on logic and principle, I think we all can do well moving forward. So once you take care of the non-controllable events, mm -hmm. this is the area that most people consider when they consider financial planning. We call the controllable events. Having an emergency fund buying a home, saving for your kids' um, college or university, paying down debt, starting a business. Most people think about only these things when it comes to financial planning. But if you don't set aside 10% while you're working, how can you save money for retirement to buy a home, send your child to college or university? It's impossible. Because whether I make $1 million now, and if I spend $1 million, I'm still broke. Mm -hmm. If I make $10,000 now and I spend $10,000, i am still broke. Still broke. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned in the beginning, individuals are making, quote unquote, um, $1 and they're spending $1.72. So to make that practical, the guy that's making $1 million is spending $1,720,000. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is he or she earning enough money? Yes. No. <laughs> but they're spending above and beyond what sure. they're bringing in. Sure. And then we complain to God and we pray to God and say, God, can you help us out of this jam? But we put ourselves into it. Mm -hmm. All right. So there lies the problem is that realize that our expenses should never exceed our income. And if that's happening outside of a time where you're underemployed or you're unemployed, we need to check ourselves and say, you know what? I need to go back to the basics. I need professional help because I cannot continue to spend God's money this way. Mm -hmm. I will only end up in a stressful situation. And as we know, the number one reason for a divorce is, is financial problems. That's right. So you can actually lose your relationship. Your children 
uh, actually now in a precarious situation as well. So there are a lot of negative consequences if we don't discipline ourselves from a financial mm -hmm. point of view. So how do you save is the next point. How do you save? First of all, you have to set a goal, whether that's buying a home, having an emergency fund, college or university, it doesn't matter. Be very specific. So I'm gonna use the acronym SMART. Be specific. Know what you want to achieve. Make sure that it's measurable. Know how much you need. So for example, I'm saving for college or university for my children. I have to be specific. I wanna send them to University of Toronto. How much is the tuition for University of Toronto when they get to college? It's $20,000 a year. I'm gonna send mm -hmm. them for four years. $80,000 in 2026. I need to start saving now if I want to fund their college education based on $80,000, right? If you're not specific, I can save $20 a month, but when they get to college or university, they can't go, they have to get OSAP or they run into problems. So mm -hmm. be specific, make sure it's measurable, make sure it's achievable. Don't set a goal that's too beyond yourself. You want to stretch yourself, but you want to make sure it's within your means. All right. So you, we need a faith element, but we also need to work with logic as well when it comes to setting goals. The third point is make sure it's relevant to you as well. And you have a time frame. So if I want to save $10,000, I would not say I want to save $10,000. What I would say is I want to save $10,000 in an emergency fund in the next two years. And by doing that, it, it will tell me how much I need to save on a monthly basis if I want to achieve that goal. So mm -hmm. once you start with your savings specific, make sure it's measurable, achievable, is relevant, and you have a time frame. We will eventually be able to achieve very, um, a lot of financial goals along the way. So that's how you save. Remember the word smart. Investing is the next level because in order for you to invest, you must develop a habit of saving. Mm -hmm. Investing is basically trying to earn a greater return on your money. When you save, you're not really trying to earn a lot of interest on your money. You just want to put mm -hmm. aside the capital to achieve a goal. Investing is trying to earn a greater return because inflation, which is about 3% every year, decreases the value of a dollar. So that glasses that you're wearing right now, if you bought that same glasses from a department store for $500, and you go next year to that same store, the price will not be $500 unless it's on sale. It'll probably be $550 because the cost of living will go up. The employees mm -hmm. want a raise. The rent is gonna go up for that business. So in order to buy the same things in the future, we have to allow our money to grow to buy the same things. And so, and when you're investing, you need to remember the acronym ART, A-R-T. Know the amount, you need to save, know the returns you're expecting, and set a time frame as well. Hmm. So um, let me just go back a little bit because there is a question that I want to yeah. ask you um, that's coming in. Um, it's saying, what if you are, and I guess it's, it goes back to the um, saving portion of, of what was just okay. mentioned. Mm -hmm. What if uh, only one breadwinner in the family? What if there is only one person who is working? So I want you to answer that. But I, I also just wanted to add this. Um, there are times that even as students yes. where we are unable to manage our finances. If you are a student and you're listening to this, manage your finances by what you get in terms of your income yes. and spend what you get. Don't spend what you don't have. Exactly. Because when you get older uh, and, you know, my, our age, I guess you can, you can mm -hmm. say that um, it's the habit of yes. spending. So you may, you may, you may not have money when you were in college, but now exactly. that you have a job, the habits of you still yes. overspending is still there. So for those of you who may be listening um, that are, part of um, just starting out in school and everything, please, this is, this is very important for you. Yes. Uh, whether you have a lot of money, whether you don't have a lot of money, whether you have a job or you don't have a job, you still have the responsibility of living within your means. 
If you are able to get that as a habit when you are young, then I believe that that is something that will help you when you do have a job and you do start making money, all of this stuff will come to play as well. But uh, the question is, what if there are, is only one breadwinner in the family? How does it change? How many children? Like children or just, just two individuals with one person working? Um, didn't say. Didn't okay, say. so even if it's one breadwinner, assuming if it's two adults or even with children, then we have to adjust our lifestyle once again, as you mentioned, to our present income. So mm -hmm. our lifestyle is always dictated based on our present income, not what we really want to do or what we did in the past. Because mm -hmm. if we don't, that's how we start spending on credit and get into debt. Mm -hmm. And to earn money, it's a privilege, not a right. I think as individuals, we think I deserve this. I'm, supp I'm supposed to have this. And we get ourselves into problems. So mm -hmm. if we assume that once again, even if I'm earning less than before, one person working by the grace of God, how can we lower our expenses? Meaning you have to look through your expenses, separate your needs from your wants, go back to your basic food, clothes, and shelter. Make sure those things are taken care of, even in a downscale version. You might have to go from owning a home to renting to living with someone. Hmm. That's okay. If your friends and family laugh at you, that's okay. That means they're not really your friends because at the end of the day, anyone that loves you will support you, not care about what you have or what position or status you had in the past. So, and, and, really, and, and there's, a, there's a reason for it, right? There's a goal in which you yes. are working towards. There's a yes. goal you're pressing towards. So, yes. you know, sometimes we get caught up in this journey, um, yep. being part of the Joneses, having this, having yep. that. But if there is a goal that you are working towards and this is how to get there in yes. order for you and your family um, to live, you know, comfortably. Um, yeah. So, yeah. You cannot be a follower when it comes to doing what is right. Mm. Because the Bible tell you narrow is the way that even leads mm. to heaven. Mm -hmm. Even though heaven is the best thing since sliced bread, most people are turning away from going to heaven mm. and they want to do their own thing. So can you imagine finances taking care of our health or doing anything else? Mm. So what God wants us to do as a steward, like you alluded to earlier, is to establish a mindset. Stewardship is not about money. It's about a mindset that whatever I have in my hands, I can manage it based on my current situation to bring glory to God, take care of myself and those that I have responsibility for. We can do it. We have to make sacrifices, but it's possible. Yes, uh, there's a quote by Dave Ramsey that I, I hear often, and it's, uh, it goes something like, uh, live, live like no one else now yes. so that you can live like no one else yes. in the future. Yes, yes, so true. And, hmm. and, and to add to that, they said, plan now so you can play later, or you play now and you'll pay later. So it's important that we, you know, have a plan. Yeah and sacrifice oh, today. Let me, let me go back to that quote. So Dave Ramsey quote, uh, just to make sure that it's, uh, I do it justice. Yes. Uh, if you will live like no one else, yes. later you can live like no one else. So true. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. So true. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. So true. Yep. We have to go against the grain. Most mm -hmm. people follow the crowd. They don't do what is right. Logically, they are based on emotion. So once again, I've heard stories and I've dealt with clients who started with nothing and end up with so much simply because they disciplined. Five families came together, live in one house. They shared a room for about four or five years, saved up their money. They bought the house next door. In 10 years, they all had a home. But for some individuals, I don't want to live with him or her. I can't live with anyone else. I need my own space, even though they're struggling. And they end up that same way for 25, 30 or 40 years and never getting ahead because they didn't want to sacrifice their pride or living with others and putting up with a situation for the short term. We have to make sacrifices in order to move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I also want to transition to, because I mentioned saving, investing, and another mm -hmm. component that's very key is estate planning. Only three out of 10 individuals have an estate plan in place having a will and a power of attorney. 
to be more specific. Sorry, let, let, let's just go back to the investing. I know we kind of went back into the savings. Sure. Um, just very quickly, I know that our time is going very yeah. quickly. Okay. Um, but in terms of investing, like, you know, how do people choose? How do you choose in terms of what to do? Yes. Or where to invest. Um, I mean, there's so many different options out there. Okay. Okay. And, and, and for a lot of folks, you know, who don't understand that whole, you know, what, what is it that, what, okay. what is the goal? You invest? How, do you, how do you go about it? So yeah. first of all, you choose a goal. So whether it's an emergency fund, saving for a down payment for a house, or just accumulating a lot of money. Once you choose your goal, you also want to fill out a risk profile. You want mm -hmm. to understand what type of investor you are. About mm -hmm. thir 13 questions. They're going to ask you how much money you need to save, when you want to withdraw this money, what's your literacy about investing, and everything mm -hmm. like that. What they're going to do is determine what type of investor you are, whether you're conservative, moderate, or aggressive. So once yeah. you have your goal, how much money you want to save and what you want to save it for, and you have your investor profile filled out professionally, they will invest that money into different type of investments based on your investment style. So if you're conservative, they'll be investing like in bonds and GICs. Mm -hmm. You're not going to earn a lot of money, but you wouldn't lose a lot of your capital that you invested. Mm -hmm. If you're a moderate investor, you're positioning yourself to earn a higher return over the same period of time. There's a risk of the upside, also the risk of the downside. But we have to take certain level of risk because inflation is 3% every year. So if our money is not earning at a minimum 3%, it's better that we keep it home under the mattress. Mm -hmm. Right? So risk is not a negative thing. It's the potential for growth as well as the potential for loss. But we need to take some risk in order for the money to grow to ensure that we can maintain our lifestyle in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So, and um, so when it comes to investing, most people are afraid of it. But what I say is, it's crazy. If you give someone $100 right now, they will spend it. Mm -hmm. Even a child, more than likely. But if you ask that person to invest $100, Will I lose my money? What is the risk involved? But when you spend the whole hundred dollars, it's gone. Your return was zero. <laughs> so yes. even if you invested and you lose five percent, you're still ahead of the game, or you could mm -hmm. potentially earn five percent. So I think our mindset, Orlando, about investing mm -hmm. needs to be enlightened, and mm -hmm. we need to actually don't listen to people. Listen to someone that's in the field. Let them sit down with you, ask all the questions, do your due diligence, and I can ensure you that you will change your mindset when it comes to investing. Okay. Okay. And so my last point really quick, because we are running out of time is estate planning. As I mentioned earlier, another part of your financial plan or being a good steward is those that I leave behind. So if I work hard for my money and I invest it, or if I have something to leave behind, I need to ensure that someone can step in and transition for me. So in putting a will in place, you need to appoint an executor. For those of you that are not familiar, an executor is someone who will step in and pay off your final debts and bills. They will take care of your final expenses, meaning funeral, and transfer whatever remaining assets you have to your named beneficiaries. Also, you need to name a guardian. Orlando, you have small children. I have small children. Many people listening might have small children or someone that they're financially responsible for. We need to designate a guardian someone that will step in and take care of our children until they become adults. Or if you have someone with a disability, that's for the rest of, of, the rest of your life. You will always mm -hmm. need someone to step in. So we need to designate a guardian that will step in and take care of our children, our loved ones, or our dependents the way that we would if we were alive. That's mm -hmm. a will and that's estate planning. And then the other component is a living will or power of attorney. Power of attorney for property, so if I'm leaving home right now, I get in a major car accident, I'm alive, but I cannot make decisions for myself. Who is going to step in and pay my bills and make sure things don't fall apart? I have a wife, but if, unless she's in writing, she cannot go, for example, if I'm banking at TD and my wife is not on a joint account, 
she cannot walk into that establishment and say, Lovato is bedridden. Can I make decisions on his behalf? Can I have access to, her, to his account? It's illegal. She would need to be in writing as a power of attorney or at least a joint account holder for her to go in there, even though she's my wife. Mm -hmm. And then it's a power of attorney also for health and finances. So I know we, we're due for time, but what I'm saying is there are a lot of things that we should have in place, but we don't have in place and we can have in place, but mm -hmm. we need to have the conversations around the table mm -hmm. with our loved ones, with our parents, with our aunts, with our uncles, and start talking about things that generation wise, we never spoke about. Because mm -hmm. if we don't, we're only hurting ourselves moving forward. Hmm. There's, a, there's a question here as it uh, pertains to equity. Yes. Um, is it wise to take equity out of your current property to purchase retirement home property? Taking equity from your existing property and buying a retirement home, to me, it's a good investment because first of all, you're taking money from one investment to acquire another investment. It's not a consumer spending item. So you're building your wealth. The only thing is if the interest rate that's on your current mortgage is lower than the other one, then that's the only determination. But at the end of the day, if you're taking from one asset to acquire another asset is never a bad thing if you can afford it and the property is a good property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, just going back to what you had mentioned about uh, wills and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do people, where do people go? If, if somebody's never done a will before, um, I do know of, but this is all I know. So. <laughs> uh, the Ontario Conference has a free service yes. um, to which uh, you are able to formulate your will. Mm -hmm. um, if any of you are interested, you can call uh, the office. Uh, yes. I believe it is uh, 905. Uh, someone has to help me out with this. What's the number to the conference? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put it up after this, but, the, but that's also an avenue and you're able to get it for free. But where, does, where else is there that people are able to do that? You can seek out a lawyer or a justice of the peace as well, and they can put together a will for you. Or believe it or not, you can actually write a will yourself and have two individuals witness it over the age of 18. That's not a part of your will. And that's fine because in the event that someone wants to contest your will, they will mm -hmm. call upon those two individuals to ensure that you were in your right mind when you made that will. So okay. you can do one yourself. If it's not complicated, seek out um, a legal professional, or you can go to your conference. If you're a part of the Seventh-day Adventist church, they have that service provided for members as well. Mm -hmm. And so just the number uh, 905-686-5757. Nine oh five six eight six five seven five seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great thing to have. You don't need to be rich, mm -hmm. um, have a lot of money. But at the end of the day, if anyone was to pass away, we need to pay off our debts. And, and within two weeks, we need to take care of final expenses as well. Mm -hmm. And if you have loved ones, once again, if you have those dependent on you, you need to have someone in place to step in or else the government will step in and if you have children under the age of 18, they will be into foster care or they'll be into the system. Because believe it or not, as parents, we are ward of the state, meaning we sign up even at birth to take care of the children. That's why if you actually abuse your child, social service can come in and take them out of your home. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's important to designate someone that you trust and have good business sense for an executor and definitely someone you trust for a guarantee from a, for a guardian, because as parents or as breadwinners, those that we love and care about, it's hard to find other people to step in and do the same thing that we would do. So, so these are um, ways in which you can still speak uh, from the grave, so to speak. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and you still have a say in your affairs as to where, how you want things done, where you want uh, yeah, certain sir. things to go. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so it is important, especially those of you who do have young children uh, and just children in general, um, to make sure that they are also taken care of, yes. you know, in an event that you may not be here mm -hmm. um, to care for them. So a lot of the stuff that you have been uh, talking about today um, is really just basic understanding of finance. Yes. yes. A lot, a lot of people, of people may be hearing this for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, when you talk about foundational stuff, this is, these are things that you need to know and understand yes. before you get to the other stuff. The most important part of a house is the foundation. If we mm -hmm. don't have a solid foundation, we can only build so high. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to know the basics. Once you know the basics, depending on your resources and your ability, you can build a triplex or you can build a tower, mm -hmm. but it's important to understand the basics, especially from a biblical perspective. And that's what I wanted to share this afternoon is basically God is expecting it of us. We have the resources, we have the ability, but we have to look to him, not to others in trying to do what we're supposed to do. Hmm. Uh, we have four more minutes left. Okay. I uh, just want to ask you a question about Texas. Yes. Right. Um, you, you did speak, uh, allude to it. Uh, maybe two things and you can answer it in your own ways. How, what is the best way to save for your children's education? Uh, I know that you, you did mention the RESPs. Um, how does that work? Just give us a, a quick scenario, but also how to minimize taxes. Okay. So if you're employed, there are two status, whether you're self-employed or whether you're employed. If you're employed, the only way you can really reduce your taxes is contributing to your RSP your registered savings plan. If you look on your notice of assessment, once you file your taxes, you can contribute up to 18% of your salary towards your RSP, less any pension that your, your company contributed towards. If you don't contribute, that money will continue to grow and then you still have an opportunity in the future. So as an advisor, we also have RSP catch-up loans. So the most efficient way is to contribute to your RSP for every dollar you contribute, it lowers your taxable income and you get a tax return based on your existing tax bracket. So that's the most simple and efficient way outside of getting into other strategies, but for the average person that's employed. Um, when it comes to education savings plan, the government has a good plan in place, what we call as the Canadian Education Savings Grant. Up to the first 2,500 you contribute every year, and you could contribute a minimum of $25 a month if you want to, the mm -hmm. government will match 20% hmm. as long as you're contributing to that plan. And there are other companies, ones in which I use for my clients, if you start early enough, if your child is under the age of five, they give you another guaranteed 15%. So I say to individuals, for starting early, where else with a low risk can you find 35% guaranteed on your money? Hmm. it's almost impossible without taking a lot of risk and it's on the plate. It's right there for us to take right for the picking, but most people, they don't use it. One of the other things that uh, I know that there is also one for, uh, for those who may have special needs. Yes. So our ESP. Yes. So there is also um, a fund also that if you put into it uh, and it's much higher than the RESP. Yes. So um, the RDSP or the Registered Disability Savings Plan right, right. is for individuals that is diagnosed with a disability. As a parent mm -hmm. or a guardian, you can contribute on behalf of your child. For okay. the first $1,500 you contribute, they match it three to one. Mm -hmm. And then anything above and beyond, they match it one to one. So mm -hmm. it's an extremely good plan. If you or someone that you know or a loved one is diagnosed with a disability, they can take advantage of this plan. And you have until the age of 59, if I'm not mistaken, to contribute mm -hmm. to the plan. That's right. And so you can actually prepare for your children's future. And it's something that definitely I know about and I'm able to take out for uh, my children as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of good knowledge. Yes. Um, a lot of good things that have been shared today. Uh, and like you said, this is a lot of foundational things. Yes that will help you build upon. Um, and so just, just being able to talk about these things and just getting more 
um, understanding of it, I think is important for anyone who is tuned in. Um, I know that, you know, when we look into next week, yes. um, go ahead and, and, and let us know what, what the topic is, because I know that our time is done. We're going to... Okay. Uh, so next week, we'll be talking about two topics in particular. The first topic is retirement, ready or not, here I come. Mm -hmm. Once again, only 30% of Canadians retire at or above the poverty line, regardless of the income that they earn. So we're going to talk about that June the 14th. And on June the 28th, we're going to be talking about the topic, how will your family survive financially without you? Please tune in. If you have any questions, follow up with Orlando, Elizabeth, or myself, and we will be happy to address any questions that you have. Because in the end, God is looking for us to be examples of him. So those that don't know him can actually see God through us. Praise the Lord. Uh, we just want to, uh, before we sign off for today, uh, we want to invite you to make sure that you tune in for next week, which is uh, June 7th, June 14th, mm -hmm. uh, same time, 7.30 to 8.30. And uh, Lovardo will be taking us through now. Um, we mentioned that this is, this is a, um, a ministry and, and, and a passion that uh, Lovardo has. And um, the ministry is called um, Smart Saber Inc. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who may want an individual consultation with him, um, there is a free 15-minute consultation uh, and a talk with him. Um, but as it is his ministry, there are some funds or costs associated with it afterwards. Um, there are, like himself, there are many who do this kind of work um, in helping you to understand your finances better. And so whether you call him or whether you don't call him, um, from my perspective, get help. Yes. Find help. Yeah. Anyone that you may know that works in this area, that may be a friend to you, uh -huh. but just get the help. Yes. Because there's so much that we don't understand that will benefit you and your family. Yes. And so if you want to get in touch with uh, Lovardo, uh, the email is um, I can save smart. The, I can save smart at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. I can save smart at gmail.com. So please um, get in contact with him. There is also a survey that is attached to this, it will be sent to you um, tomorrow. Um, that if you have any questions or things that you liked about it, things that you um, thought could improve this webinar that we are having, then please go ahead and fill that out. We will take a look at it and try to improve on it for next week. All right, but for tonight, we thank you, Lovardo, for um, sharing with us, for laying that foundation. I know that there are many out there who are uh, blessed and happy to tune in and uh, to just know this information that will take them uh, further, uh, further than, than what they're at right now. Yes. Um, so close us off with a word of prayer. Yes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn from your word how we can become better stewards. You've said in your word that we can be fruitful, we can multiply, and we can have dominion. God, help us to be shining lights in this world of darkness. Many people are hurting. Many people are looking for the truth. And unless they see God through us, they will never see you. Help us, Lord, in our very own way to reach out for help if we need it, and also share this information with our friends, our family, and our loved ones. I thank you for the ministry um, of Orlando and Elizabeth and the conference that's facilitating this information session. And we know everything that is done here today, we want it to be done to your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much once again, everyone who joined in. Uh, we wish God's blessings upon you, and we hope to see you next week, same day, same time, same channel. God bless. God bless.